This is 15 Minute Fundamentals, where we interview core contributors within crypto and together walk through the charts available on Token Terminal. In this episode, we discuss the basics of Optimism, a fast and scalable Ethereum Layer 2 blockchain. As the number of people using Ethereum has increased, certain capacity limitations have been reached and the cost of using the network has increased causing the need for scaling solutions. The main goal of scalability is to increase transaction speed and transaction throughput without sacrificing decentralization or security. There are different types of scaling solutions, but today we'll focus on optimistic rollups as optimism falls in this category. Optimistic rollups reduce computation on the main Ethereum chain by processing transactions off-chain, offering significant improvements in processing speeds. Unlike other scaling solutions such as sidechains, optimistic rollups derive security from mainnet by publishing transaction results on-chain, but store transaction data elsewhere. As computation is the slow and expensive part of using Ethereum, optimistic rollups can offer up to a 100-time improvement in scalability. Today, we'll find out how optimism works, how it's positioned within the Ethereum ecosystem, the team's current focus areas, and their plans for the future. Hi, Smith. Welcome to 15 Minute Fundamentals. It is a pleasure to have you on. It's a pleasure to be on. Now, before we dive into any of the details, it would be great if you can give a quick introduction to optimism and especially from the perspective of how you're positioned within this whole layer two landscape. Sure. So optimism generally is a layer two scaling solution for Ethereum. And what that means is we specifically scale the Ethereum blockchain through a technology called optimistic rollups, which I can go into later as well. We originally started out as a group called Plasma Group with the original founders, Carl, Ben, and Jing. And as time went on, we found that Plasma as a technology, though able to scale infinitely, did not see much usage. And after doing research on why, we realized one key realization, which is that there was a massive massive developer experience issue. So developers like building on things that they understand and know, right? So this is the EVM. So we set out to create the best developer experience possible for EVM developers as a start. And we took it a step further by coining the term EVM equivalence rather than just EVM compatibility, because we really wanted to minimize that diff between Ethereum and optimism. So that's a bit about the technological background. What makes us different, I'd say, is um, we specifically, one, we inherit the security of Ethereum, right? So we're a scaling solution that's not trying to cannibalize Ethereum. That's the first thing. And uh, the second thing is we really align our mission with this concept of retroactive public goods, which um, we're trying to build really, really good open software and redefine incentive models for ecosystems and have the incentives align a bit better to create the very, very necessary pieces for ecosystems to succeed. So it could be the bridges to a city, essentially taking the model of creating very, very strong, robust cities and applying that to blockchain. Great overview, thank you. And then a general question on Ethereum scaling solutions. You mentioned that Optimism is an optimistic rollup. Now, for anyone not familiar with the different types of scaling solutions, can you quickly explain how an optimistic rollup works and what the other types of scaling solutions out there are? Absolutely. So like I said, all scaling solutions generally in the rollup category inherit their security from some parent chain. So there's optimistic rollups, ZK rollups. The parent chain that most of these rollups inherit their security from today is Ethereum mainnet. And it doesn't have to work like that, but that's how it works today. And the way it functionally works is that these rollups execute transactions outside of Ethereum, but we post our data back to mainnet. So we want to maintain the state between Ethereum mainnet and the rollup. So that's how rollups work. But there are also other solutions like sidechains that have their own validator stat, but they're just like security compromises and decentralization compromises that you have to give up when you try to do something that isn't specifically to uh, maintain state with Ethereum. So yeah, the, th the three that I see today are optimistic rollups, ZK rollups, and there are sidechains. So those are three different ways to scale onto different um, ecosystems. Got it. Then on to fundamentals. It would be great if you can describe Optimism's whole economic model, the different stakeholders involved, their roles, how fees are paid and earned within your whole ecosystem. Absolutely. So I think I mentioned the concept of retroactive public goods. So our economic model is largely based on this idea today, and it's based on three other large properties that feed into retroactive public goods. So those three properties are generally value will accrue to token holders through revenues being directed to public goods. So creating that infrastructure, which will then create a stronger ecosystem and drive block space demand. So that's one part of the flywheel. The other part is for builders and contributors. So we really want to have a strong emphasis on the infra and the tooling and the education. So we also do this 
through public goods because there is no other way to fund them other than public goods. You see tools like Hard Hat today, like all of these very, very necessary tools that impact devs, users, protocols, institutions, other parties. There is no funding model for them. So this is also going into that. And the final thing is obviously accruing value to users and community members. We do future airdrops. We're going to be doing those incentive programs from ecosystem funding. And again, public goods will also feed into the user flywheel by giving them a much larger or much cleaner experience overall. Got it. And then if I pull up the revenue share chart from Optimism's dashboard on Token Terminal, we can see that of total fees paid to transact on the network, a portion goes to the sequencer and the rest goes to post transaction data onto the Ethereum mainnet. Can you just break this down for us? So how the fees paid by users flow in a bit more detail? Yeah, that, that's, that's a good question. So currently the way that Optimism operates is fees that are generated by the sequencer go into feeding towards retroactive public goods, right? So we don't keep any of the money that we generate. Uh, we actually put it back into public goods. So we'll do these retro PGF rounds, to fund further ecosystem goods that'll further grow the economy. And then for L1, we spend a certain amount of money, obviously, to uh, maintain state. And this is probably the largest cost that we have today to maintain the state L1 batching. And we have other technological initiatives on our roadmap to make sure that we can lower this cost over time. So we have 4844 that we're working with the F on and Coinbase on to lower fees significantly. And hopefully just in general, batching will just become much, much cheaper over time to maintain state. But yeah, as of now, as gas spikes on L1, the L1 batching also spikes. So it is a big portion of our fees today. And what would you say are the current main growth drivers for Optimism? As a member of the business development team, the main growth drivers currently are we want to grow a strong developer community. Everything starts with the developers, in our opinion. We want to create a really, really strong EVM growth roadmap. And the only way to do it is first to scale the technology, right? So we block out all devs if the technology is not scalable. So that's what rollups were created for initially. On the other side, we also want to minimize existential risk. So we see this as one of the biggest challenges for growth, whether it's compliance, whether it's security related, we operate a bridge today, obviously. So we want to make sure that this is not a bottleneck for developer growth and user growth as well. So it's another one that we work on every single day. And then on the foundation side, so I work at Labs currently, but on the OP foundation side, we work towards creating the strongest community because we believe community is the strongest mode that exists. So this in itself is a very difficult task, but if done correctly, it's incredibly powerful and would be the underpin that differentiates us from most ecosystems. Check out our governance forums, very, very active and chaotic. Our Discord is very, very active and chaotic, but this is sort of what we wanted to build on top of because the most active developer community and user community will be the one that sticks around the longest. Yeah, sounds great. And then outside of all the market volatility and the unfortunate events of the past few weeks, are you facing any specific challenges? And if yes, what kind of actions are you taking to uh, tackle those? Initially, we set out and we wanted to create a ton of DeFi integrations, right? Because DeFi was like the main category for usage growth at the time. And over time, we got hit with a couple of those Ponzi's and some of these apps that were not aligned with our ecosystem. And that made it very difficult and challenging to figure out exactly what are the best things to incentivize, right? We don't want to keep restarting the speculative casino forever. So we set out to do a couple other verticals that we're working on today. Uh, governance is a really, really strong underpin, like I said, of our um, foundation. But on the lab side, we're working on a couple of different categories that we believe will provide strong, strong growth that we have yet to prove, but we are going to be working with very, very strongly over the course of the next year or two. So we have NFTs and DAOs. We're very, very bullish on those two things. Centralized exchanges and wallets. We want to create those strong pieces of infrastructure that create the best user experience possible. And we've noticed that right now, the UX today is just not feasible to onboard the next billion users onto crypto and Web3. So we really do want to solve those challenges. And you may see like very, very strong partnerships from a branding perspective, but we've yet to see what that is actually going to pan out to over time. So yeah, it's largely based on finding really, really strong product market fit and having a strong thesis behind what that product market fit is and then trying to iterate on top of it over time. So uh, very general, but those are like mainly the categories that we're focusing on today. And speaking about the next one billion users, what do you see as the things that will drive that growth? And how are you at Optimism looking to make that happen in practice? 
Yeah, no, that's that's a great question. I have my own thesis on it. If you ask somebody else on the team, they'll have a completely different thesis on it as well. I would say that to onboard the next billion users on the crypto, well, since I lead the DeFi team at Optimism, my answer is very much geared towards how are we going to get a billion users on chain first? And there are things like making sure that we abstract away that idea entirely, right? So things are going to be used underneath the hood. Are people going to use liquid staking derivatives, those kind of things? Probably not. It's not the best use case for a billion users, but things like savings accounts are very, very good use cases. Everybody's going to need that. Stable coins and their composability and interoperability between countries is a very, very interesting use case that I'm excited about. So yeah, I, I would say very general concepts, payments. Those are probably like the strongest long-term use cases that we see driving sustainability and driving product market fit. But if we take a look at what exists today in DeFi, there are very small subset of users that want to use derivatives or that want to use yield optimization. So that's not the only use case that we want to bootstrap forever. Essentially, blockchains are to drive human coordination. And we really want to find uh, use cases that are for those first principles rather than what exists just today. You've emphasized the importance of your community, their engagement and rewarding users. So I wanted to ask about the OP airdrop number one, and especially the thought process behind how tokens were distributed so that you ensured they go to the most deserving users? Sure, yeah, this was a very difficult problem. So uh, I was working more on like the advisory side and we had an entire data team carving out exactly how they wanted to orient the airdrop. And the vision for the airdrop really came from our founders. So we distributed about 5% of our OP token supply during the first airdrop. And the airdrop was targeted towards a couple different groups of people. The first group would be people that behave in positive some ways, right? So we're really trying to figure out what type of community we want the optimism network to have and the airdrop was our user acquisition strategy so we did firstly the people that behave in positive some some ways so this could be gitcoin donors people that really align with retroactive public goods that sort of stuff we had people that contribute actively in their communities so uh people that are voting very very often on snapshot people that are very active in governance we are really excited about those people in web3 especially as we decentralize even further and then people that have been priced out of ethereum right so if you're using other networks and you cannot afford to transfer transact on Ethereum. We're excited to see what types of use cases come out of scale and the types of users that are really using blockchains once they do scale. So those are really like the three big categories. We were able to target about 250,000 addresses for the airdrop. So we wanted a really wide distribution so that we could try to encompass as many members of the community as possible. Makes sense. And the current role of the OP token is purely governance, right? It's plain and simple like that. The OP token is the governance token for the Optimism Collective. It will be used to govern the protocol for the years to come, especially as we further decentralize. Yeah. And then we've been speaking a lot about growth, but just one more. And this one should be a walk in the park for you as part of the BD team. What kind of role do partnerships play for Optimism? Partnerships are a very, very important thing. The amount of people that are building in Web3 today is a limited amount. So Every partnership counts for sure. So as a member of the BD team, it's incredibly important to create strong partnerships that can grow over time. We like to work with teams that are working towards building sustainable protocols. They're very, very strong visionaries. We like to work really, really closely with teams that have just started as well to give them everything that they need to build out a strong, strong product over the course of the next year or two, whatever it may be. And in general, we want to bring strong PMF and product market fit to optimism, whether that be from things that exist today or things that have not been tested. So yeah, it, I think partnerships entirely drive the branding, the usage that ecosystems have today. So you may see like very, very strong partnerships coming out from a branding perspective that have yet tested themselves, but it is a huge, huge sell to developers to feel much more attracted to build on top of ecosystems as well. So we're very, very excited about partnerships and we're scaling out that team the most at Optimism today. It's probably our main focus, one of our main focuses at least on top of the developer growth. And then my next question is kind of like an evergreen topic in terms of subjects that come up when speaking about L2s, and that is whether they are good for Ethereum or not? I'd love to hear your take on that. It's a great question. And L2s are not always positive sum for Ethereum. Some of them are not, some of them are. In our case, optimism is very, very positive sum with Ethereum. This was originally the vision set out by Vitalik and the rest of the Ethereum Foundation to scale Ethereum. So we have no intention on foregoing that responsibility of either paying rent to Ethereum as a true settlement layer. We will continually inherit the security of Ethereum because that is our 
value prop. And we will always, at least to my knowledge, we will always utilize ETH as our gas token. So being aligned with Ethereum long term is very, very important to us. We currently work very, very closely with the EF and other large entities like Coinbase to push forward the protocol on the development level with 4844 and other EIPs. So we're very incentivized to help Ethereum grow. Very well put. And then finally, what's next for Optimism? Is there any sneak peeks you can give us into your mid to long term roadmap? So our team just came back from a retreat. So we're very excited and motivated to build through the bear. I would say that, like I said, there are three big places that we're trying to grow the most. As of now, it's going to be related to developer community and the technical roadmap. So we have a roadmap for decentralization. We have a roadmap for fault proofs and that sort of stuff. We want to mainly create a very similar similar experience to Ethereum, right? So we can't claim that we're exactly what Ethereum provides because there's a centralization risk with our sequencer still. So we're working very hard to make sure that these risks don't exist long term. So that's the technical roadmap. On the community roadmap, we're very, very incentivized to grow our community, whether it's the governing community or if it's the developer community. Both are very, very much strong parts of our strategy today. So uh, yeah, definitely come check out the governance forums. They're very, very hectic, but uh, exciting place to be. And then we have the growth category on different verticals. So we're still working on DeFi today. So we're going to be trying to push that forward and build really, really strong use cases that are sustainable. We are working on NFTs and DAOs as well, and also creating very necessary infrastructure like centralized exchanges and the uh, wallets integrations as well. And yeah, so I would say our largest push will be for value line developers. So we welcome everybody that wants to come to our hackathons. We're thinking about incubators and much more and building the best open source software. Awesome. Can't wait to see how everything plays out. Thank you so much, Smith, for taking the time to do this and giving us a great overview of optimism. We'll make sure to do this again in the near future to dive deeper into some of the topics we touched on. Absolutely. It was great chatting.